Ah, good evening, my precious Lord. We thank you that we've had a safe holiday, that the hustle and bustle is behind us, and that we get to start a new year gathering into your house, learning your word, Father, as we follow your footprints as the mighty Father that you are, Lord. Help us to be a good reflection of who you are. Help us to look over these maps and hold on to the information, Lord, just to give your word character, Father. As, as it has for me, I pray that you would just use me as a vessel just to pour me out, that uh, those listening too, Father, would just uh, be set aflame, put, a, put on fire for your word, Father. So we thank you again. Just bless this evening. Think through my mind, speak through my lips, and be glorified in all that we do. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So I was jokingly going to come in and start with the book of Ruth, which is where we should have left off. And I will tell you that it was a little bit hard because Ruth has a ton of information. So I love the book of Ruth for that reason. But I would have had one map up here that said Bethlehem. And that would have wrapped up the class because I think that that whole period was just there in Bethlehem. I mean, she was a Moabitess and et cetera. But for the most part, that's all it was taking place at. So we're going to skip Ruth and we're going to go straight into Samuel. And boy, let me tell you what, there's a lot that I learned in Samuel that, you know, one of the things that I have loved about doing this is going th through this study through the eyes of the maps has just opened my eyes into how much more, you know, how much we miss when we don't know these parts, you know, the, the books. So what this should have been was 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and just move right through the, the, the one two one twos. But tonight we're only going to get to the first 15 chapters of 1 Samuel because there was just no way that I could get any more information. I have seven pages of notes <laughs> um, to go through. So um, tonight what I also did was I brought in a new study sheet. Uh, I'm still trying to learn on what's going to help you guys to kind of hold on to this stuff. So tonight... We have in a fill-in sheet. And as we're going through it, we'll fill it out together. And then probably, what's that? Yes, okay, good, good. Because it, it'll be easier, I think, to hold on to information. And I think we'll probably base our tests around this so you guys don't feel like you're blown out of the water. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and do the opener for First Samuel. First, the book of 1 Samuel describes the transition of leadership in Israel from judges to kings. There are pre -pre three prominent characters in this book. It's going to be Samuel, the last judge and first prophet, Saul, the first king of Israel, and David, the king-elect, anointed but not yet recognized as, as Saul's successor. This book has many translations of its title. This was interesting. As I was going through and I was learning Pastor always talks about 1st Kings, 2nd Kings, 3rd Kings, 4th Kings when they're in Bulgaria. And as I was going through this, originally 1st and 2nd Samuel was known as one book called Samuel. His name has been variously translated from the name of God, his name is God, heard of God. The Septuagint divides Samuel into two books, even though it is one continuous story, and its division breaks up the history of David. What was interesting is, that if I remember correctly, there's 31, 32 chapters of First Samuel, and right at 15 is where David starts coming in, chapter 16, it's where he comes in. So he even splits First Samuel with David coming in. In the Greek, the title is called the Books of Kingdoms, referring to the later kingdoms of Israel and Judah. First Samuel was called First Kings, Second Samuel, Second Kingdoms, oh, excuse me, Kingdoms, First Kingdoms, Second Kingdoms, uh, Third Kingdoms and Fourth Kingdoms. Uh, first Kings, Second Kings was Third and Fourth Kingdoms. 
Uh, the author was traditional to Samuel as the author. However, his death in chapter 25 makes it clear that he did not write all of Samuel 1 and Samuel 2. But according to chapter 20, uh, 1025, he did write a book. And 1 Chronicles 29, 29 refers to the book of Samuel the seer, the book of Nathan the prophet, and the book of Gad the seer. Seems that all three men contributed to these two books. The time of Samuel, the time of Samuel has stretched over about 94 years. It starts off from the birth of Samuel to the death of Saul. The Christ in Samuel, Samuel is the type of Christ in that he is a prophet, a priest, and a judge. David is one of the primary Old Testament portrayers of the person of Christ. He's born in Bethlehem, works as a shepherd, rules as king of Israel. God enables David, a man after his own heart, to become the greatest king of Israel. The New Testament calls Christ the seed of David, according to the flesh, and the root of the offspring of David. Here are the keys to the book of Samuel. The key word is transition. First Samuel records the critical transition in Israel from the rule of God through the judges to his rule through the kings. This transition goes through three stages. It goes from Eli to Samuel, from Samuel to Saul, and from Saul to David. The key verse is 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14. It says, But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be the commander of his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. The second key verse is 1 Samuel 15, 22, where it says, So Samuel said, has the Lord as has the Lord as a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed the fat of rams. The key chapter of Samuel is going to be first Samuel fifteen. These are a little bit different than if you do in the Old Testament survey. Um, I'm taking these off of my open Bible that has different than that of the Old Testament surveys. But 1 Samuel 15, this records the tragic transition of kingship from Saul to David. As in all three changes recorded in 1 Samuel, God removes his blessing from one and gives it to another because of sin, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. A quick survey of 1 Samuel. Again, 1 Samuel records a crucial transition from the theocracy under the judges to the monarchy, monarchy under the kings. It's built by three men, Samuel, Saul, and David. Samuel's main chapters are going to be chapter 1 through 7. Saul's main chapter is going to be 8 through 31. And David's chapters 16 through 31. Samuel, 1 through 7. Samuel's story begins late in the turbulent times of Judges when Eli is the judge priest of Israel. The birth of Samuel and his early call by God are found in chapters 1 through 3. Because of his responsiveness to God, he is confirmed as a prophet at a time when the word of the Lord was rare. Okay, so it's a, it's a famine, what, what, what's the right word? The, the revelation of God is not there. Like yes, like a drought. <laughs> um, corruption at Shiloh by Eli's notorious wicked sons leads to Israel's defeat in the crucial battle with the Philistines. The Ark of the Covenant is lost to the Philistines. The priesthood is disrupted by the death of Eli and his sons, and the glory of God departs from the tabernacle. 
Samuel begins to function as the last of the judges and the first of the order of the prophets. His prophetic ministries leads to a revival in land, the return of the ark, and the defeat of the Philistines. But when Samuel grows old and his sons prove to be unjust judges, the people cry wrongfully. And that was, that was one of the things that was, caught me interested. It was wrongfully cried out for a king. They wanted a visible and a judicial ruler that can be like all other nations. So they wanted to start looking like the world, talking like the world, acting like the world. Saul, so, in 8 through 15, in their impatient demand for a king, Israel chooses less than God's best. Their motive and criteria are all wrong. Saul comes out of the gate well, but soon starts getting worse and worse. Even though Samuel warned them, Saul and the people began to act wickedly. Saul takes on the role of priest and offers up a sacrifice. He makes a foolish vow and disobeys God's command to destroy the, the Amalekites. Samuel's powerful world, words in chapter 15, 22 and 23 triggers a pathetic response. Here is where God tells Saul to kill all the Amalekites, the people, the animals, everything. But instead, Gaul, uh, instead, Saul takes prisoner Agog, the king of the Amalekites, and the people took sheep and oxen and the best of the things, which should have been destroyed in order to use them as a sacrifice to God. And Saul's response, Well, I've sinned, for I've transgressed the commandments of the Lord and your word, because I feared the people and they obeyed their voice instead. How many times have we done that? You know, the wife, the kids, the boss, the whatever. And then in Saul and David, 16 through 31, when God rejects Saul, he commissions Samuel to anoint David as Israel's next king, who serves in Saul's courts and defeats the Philistine Goliath. Jonathan's devotion to David leads him to a sacrifice to sacrifice the throne an acknowledgement of David's divine right to it. There's a lot to say about Jonathan on that part. It's a selfless act knowing that he could have the throne, but instead knowing that God has picked David for the throne, he gives that up. David became a threat to the insanely jealous Saul but is protected from Saul's wrath by Jonathan, Micah, and Samuel. Saul's open rebellion against God turns into his refusal to give up what God said cannot be his. Saul tries again to murder David, but is protected by Jonathan. Saul became even more active in his pursuit of David. The future king flees to a Philistine city. David continues to escape the hand of Saul, and on two occasions spares Saul's life when he had the opportunity to take it. Saul, afraid of his impending battle against the Philistines, consults a medium at Endor to hear the advice of deceased Samuel's uh, advice of the deceased, Samuel's advice. The Lord rebukes Saul, pronounces his doom, him and his sons are killed by the Philistines on Mount Gilboa. Okay, that is our opener. That's weird that that turned off. Okay. So, ha <laughs> Here we are, people. This is where we are. So, you see that we're sitting right in Judah. So, we're going to be looking in the Benjamin Ephraim area is where we're going to be going into. You see that this area here is going to be the land of the Philistines. And as we're going through it, most of our stuff's going to take place in through here. Now, how many of you guys brought your pencils? Probably. See how you guys are? See how you are? Okay. I have some too if you guys want to share. So what I'm going to do is, the way that I've been trying to break up my studies is to do it by chapter. Can you guys share over there? I'm trying to break them up by chapter and then putting a color coordination behind them so we can see because otherwise there's just so many names, so many people, so many places to try to follow. Okay? 
So with our first, and this is where we're going to go back to our little paper here, is we're going to start off in the first chapter of Samuel. And it opens up with, with there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. Okay? <clears throat> so our story starts off in Ramathaim Zophim, which is going to be right here. I don't know if your yeah, it should be in there. So the way that I have my broken up, I, you guys do as you do, but I have chapters one through three are going to be in green, four through six in blue, and chapter seven through nine in orange. Okay? If there is a doubling over, I have blue and then a little hood over it of orange, letting me know that it's in both chapters, if you will. But whatever makes sense of this for you. Okay, so in the little paper here, it says uh, the name of the city that Ekna was from is what? Ramathaim. Yep, Ramathaim Zephoim, which is there. It just goes by Ramathaim here. In the mountains of Ephraim, there was a certain man, Elkna. He had two wives. He had Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, and Hannah had none. Each year they went up to Shiloh. So here we are going from Shiloh. So they're here. Oh, no, that's a lie. He's from here. They go into Shiloh. They live in Ramah. Okay, so Ramah is where they live. And Shiloh is where they go up to sacrifice. So Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, Oh, I forgot how to say that. Say Phineas, Phineas? Okay, let's go with that. That, I, I, that sounds right to me. Then priests of the Lord were there. Elkna would uh, give Penina portion to her and all of her sons, but would give a double portion to Hannah because he loved her and God had closed her womb. So it goes on to say that Penina would harass Hannah and tease her about not having children and she would begin to cry. And as any good man would do, Say something stupid. Elkna would say, aren't I better than ten men? Ten sons? So after dinner, Hannah went to pray and petitioned God's throne to have ch uh, children. And Eli saw her with her lips moving, but uh, didn't hear nothing, so he thought she was drunk. Okay, So we're kind of just going to be skimming through this. So we are somewhere in... Yeah, somewhere right around 14. I was thinking a little bit higher, but... And um, Eli's... Um, so Hannah makes an oath with God to, to give... Uh, sorry. So Hannah makes an oath with God that if God would grant her a child, that she would give God her firstborn. Then again, when Eli accused her of being drunk, she answered. Now, I love her answer. <laughs> she says, No, my lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. And this is what's great here. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of my abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. You can almost hear Eli saying, Oops, <laughs> my bad. Because okay. I can almost hear that. He's all like, stop being drunk. Why are you drinking? It's still early. Why are you being drunk? And then her acting out saying, don't think that I'm some wicked woman. I'm not. So then it goes on to say that Samuel was born. In verse 19, it says, And there rose up early in the morning to worship for the Lord and returned, came back to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. Okay, so she named him Samuel. So in our little paper there, where did, uh, okay, so let's go through this together. Name of the city that Elkanah was at, it was from? Remember that I seen, yep. Where did Elkanah go every year to worship? Up to Shiloh. And where was Samuel born? Good. 
Rama Thaim? No. Uh, Rama is going to be right here. Yeah, two different places. Yeah. All right. So Samuel's born, and at the end of the chapter, she is taking a sacrifice up to the Lord to give Samuel up to Eli, the priest, and they worshiped together. Chapter 2. We have this Hannah prophetic prayer, and I'm trying not to do a lot of studying as opposed to staying with the map idea, but uh, that, was, that was a really good read if there's a time that you want to go back through and read it. But we're going to go to verse 11. It says, Then Elgna went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli, the priest. <clears throat> So in chapter 2, we have the prophetic prayer of Hannah, then the sinfulness of Eli's son in Shiloh. Taking what was not theirs, they would prostitute the women at the tabernacle. So the women that would be at the, the door of meeting, I think is what it's called, he basically, they would prostitute them out and uh, have their way with them. I should say it that way. Um, but God had rebuked Eli because he did nothing to restrain his sons, and his sons became uh, because of their vile acts from being priests. Let's say it again. Because he did nothing to restrain his sons because of their vile acts from, uh, from being priests. Then the word of the Lord does not come to Eli. Chapter 3. Opens with the word, the Lord was rare. So it opens up with the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no revelation. God speaks to Samuel. And I, I listen to this. Okay, so how I start my study is I'll listen to, I have a, the Bible on cassette, uh, CD. So I'll listen to the story first before I start taking this apart. So this part here, when Samuel, when God comes to Samuel, he sounds like a little kid. And I don't know how big or how old Samuel was when he started taking, taking this position, but... It says the Lord came to him and said, Samuel. And you almost hear these little feet patter. Here I am. And he says it in this real, here I am, high voice like a little boy. And Eli says, I, I didn't call you. He says, oh, okay. So he goes back. And the Lord says, Samuel. See, here's a little. Here I am. You called? I didn't call you. So he goes back again. It happens. And then on the, first, on the fourth one, I think it was, it says that the Lord stood before him. And, and, and Eli told him, he says, when, if it happens again, say, here's your servant. You know, I'm listening. But it said that, he had, that God had stood in front of him. Um, then, matter of fact, let me see if I can get there real quick. Yeah, verse 10 says, Now the Lord came and stood and called as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered. And it says, Speak to your servant. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm failing to do this part. I'm trying to get too much. Ramathayim. I thought the black and white picture with the guy riding his mule was perfect. Okay, I thought, what an old feeling that this gives of what it would have looked like them traveling across this, this area. So from Ramathaim, here's Shiloh. This is where the tabernacle was at. Look, at. look at the landscape of it. I think it through here is the actual Shiloh. Now remember, as we've been going through this, if you remember Bathsheba, uh, Beersheba, Beersheba was this little land mass. When we went into Joshua, was it Joshua or was it? Um, Zeboim? But again, it was, it was no, no, it was uh, uh, Jericho. 
Jericho was a real small little area also. So it's interesting on how the land masses, I mean, we hear these numbers, we're going to be going over these numbers that are huge, we're talking 30,000 Philistines. And you're looking at, where, you know, now we can see a little bit idea where you can fit, but could you imagine what this would look like with mass amounts of people in it? All right, so the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel of which both the ears of everyone will hear. It will tingle. And I forgot my train of thought. Oh, so then, and uh, verse 14, And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So God tells Samuel what, Eli's fate is, basically. So Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. For God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said. Could you imagine? Could you imagine what that would feel like? <laughs> You know, there's a, there was one time that uh, I was talking to a friend of mine. We were supposed to go paintballing. And I called him up, and I was all, hey, dude, we're going to go. He said, hey, dude, my wife's not going to let me go. And that bugged me because I was one of our biggest passions was playing. So I hung the phone up, and I put it under my leg, and we go on. And I'm like, I can't believe, you know, he's doing this and, blah, you know, the stupid stuff. And next thing then, no, the phone's ringing. And I pick it up, and it's him. I was like, hey, he changed his mind. Well, I never hung the phone up. So all the things that I had said about his wife, he heard. He heard okay? So as I'm hearing this here, it's one of those things like, God do to you all this if you don't tell me what God said. I mean, that point where you have to tell him, you know. So then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Okay, so he told him everything that was going to go on. So then uh, this is going to be on your paper here. And it says, now Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And let none of the words fall to the ground. Verse 20 says, And all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as the prophet of the Lord. Now, oh, here's Ramah. So this is where they were born. This is where Samuel was born. This is where Elkna was living at. I, you know, I mean, obviously you see all the buildings up here, but you know, if you just kind of step back and kind of blur that out, I mean, what a view to be, you know? And, and I'm selfish to say, could you imagine sleeping underneath the stars and just what the sky would look like? I think if you guys remember when we were doing Genesis 1, we looked at all the stars of Israel. It was really pretty. Um, Shiloh? In the middle, there's sort of a ridge around. And through here, up through here? Further down. Right in there. Right in there? Nope, right above there. See where that ridge is? Yeah. That kind of... What about it? Oh, yeah. Footprint. All right. right in the yeah, I could see you. <laughs> that's, it's like a that's pretty cool. So the heel Are you talking through here? No. Oh, you're talking the whole big thing? Nope. Just, uh, you got to show us. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> my, my vision is different than everyone's. <laughs> but when I spotted this, I saw... Like this is the heel, 
and this is the toes, and this, you know, this is oh, the I see. print, and that's probably where the temple mount was. Gotcha. <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> Many of the, the sites that they found were in the shape of the foot. And then when you see it, you don't hear it like that. Right. I love these aerial views. Okay, so this was interesting here because I got to remember Dan was split. But uh, in verse 20, it says, All Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Beersheba is right here. Okay, it sits on the kind of the bottom end of the Dead Sea area. When I first heard Dan, because the first place that I ever put Dan is way up by Naphtali and Asher, in between Naphtali and Manasseh, to be Dan. But today, as I was going over this, it struck me that Dan is also a small portion that's over here. So to say from Dan to Beersheba, that probably made more sense because everything here is here, you know, taking place here, rather than way up on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. So uh, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but it made sense to me that it stays in this general vicinity. And then the Lord appeared again to Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh. Okay, so... We're back to Shiloh area. Oh my gosh, thank you. <clears throat> in, in your defense of your statement, if you, this is a map you gave us of the 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. If you really wanted to talk about this whole area, you would be talking about this. Correct, land. correct. Mm -hmm. Because it is the whole land of Canaan. But, and, and that's what first came to mind. I was like, the whole land knew. Because of how everything is crammed here. There's nothing that go. We don't really go too high. Uh, this Shalisha, which is... Um, so if you come up, um, Shechem is like here. So it's still real low on the map. Mm -hmm. So to be up above Galilee, there's nothing else up there right now. So that's why I changed it. <clears throat> and so from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel would be established as the prophet of the Lord then the Lord appeared again to Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel by the word of the Lord so now we're going to go into chapter 4 this is the first battle with the Philistines and Israel went out to battle against this should be on your paper, too, if I remember correctly. The Israel camped around Ebenezer, which is here. And the Philistines camped in Aphek here. So this is where the first Philistine battles were about to take place. <clears throat> Then the Philistines put themselves in the battle array against Israel, and when they had joined battle, Israel defeated. Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed 4,000 men of the army of the field. Let's see if I have. So here is Ebenezer. Um, in this battle, because they had lost so bad, Israel decided the best thing that they could do is go and get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it into the battle. So in verse 7 says, The Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us, we will deliver us, who will deliver us from the hands of the mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in Israel. <clears throat> And so the Philistines fought Israel was defeated, uh, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled. There was a great slaughter, and f there fell of the Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. So this is where they lost the Ark of the Covenant. It was in Ebenezer? It was in, 
Yeah, no, it was in, that's where they were camped. So they brought, they brought from Shiloh, they brought the Ark into Ebenezer because they wanted to win the battle of, against the Philistines. And then God allowed them to lose. 30,000 men were killed. And so now it, it looks like um, they have lost the covenant, uh, the Ark. <clears throat> a man of Benjamin came and told Eli that the Ark of the Covenant was captured and his two sons were dead. <laughs> the next verse says, when he heard about the Ark, he fell over and broke his neck and died. <laughs> right? That's a bad day. But what is interesting is when Eli heard Okay, so let's go to verse 14 in chapter 4. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man qu came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim he couldn't see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who comes from the battle, and I fled from the battle line. And he said, What happened to my sons? So the messenger answered, and he said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also, your two sons, Hophni and fin fin what is it? Phineas, Phineas <laughs> are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. What would be your first thought when it came down to hearing this news? Shock. Definitely shock. But I'm like, my sons are dead? We lost? <laughs> we lost? Yeah. You know? But what's interesting is it says... Um, where did I leave myself? Then it happened when he made mention of the ark that Eli, so it was the ark of God, that he says, the ark's been captured. Yeah. And he falls over and he breaks his neck and he dies. He was and he's old and heavy. Uh, he had judged Israel for 40 years. What is even more fun in this story is that Phineas' wife was pregnant. Phineas, who is Eli's son, his wife was pregnant, and when she heard that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor, she had the child, and then she died. It's been a rough day, it's been a rough day in the family here, right? And then in her dying breath, she names her son Ichabod, saying, the glory has departed from Israel. Wow, what an ending to that story, huh? So then going into chapter 5, it says that the Philistines took the ark and brought it into the house of Dagon in their house of their gods. God knocked over Dagon and they put him back up where he did it again. This time God broke the arms and the head of Dagon. So, so now we have the ark that has toppled their god so they want it out. So from Ebenezer, they took it to Ashdod, which is down here. From Ashdod, they took it to Gath, which is over here. And then from Gath, they took it to Ekron, which is up here. Okay? So from Ebenezer to Ashdod, Ashdod to Gath, and then Gath to Ekron. That is on your piece of paper here. Oh, what Ek Ekron. Ek okay. When the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant in battle, they sent it to different locations. Name those locations. It's from Ebenezer to Ashdod, Ashdod to Gath, Gath to Ekron. Technically, there's three Three places. Um, scripture has it. Ashdod, Gath, and Ekron. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> so, <laughs> here's the fun part. So, everywhere that they're going, okay, so I'm going to go through this real quick. 
So when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon, set it in his place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left on it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor anyone who came into Dagon's heads tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he, ra and he ravaged, ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. territory. And the men of Ashdod saw how, how it was. They said, The Ark of the Covenant of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh towards us and, uh, and Dagon our God. Therefore they sent and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the Ark of, the of Israel? They said, Let's take it to be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark to, of God of Israel away. So it was that when they carried the hand of the Lord was against that city with a very great destruction, and he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore they sent the ark of the covenant to Ekron. So it was that the ark was came to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They brought the ark of the God of Israel to kill us, to kill our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of Philistines and said, Send to the ark of the God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so it doesn't kill us and our people. There was a deadly destruction throughout the city and the hand of God was heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. What makes this fun is if you look this up, and, I, and this is a Chuck Misler term, but I looked it up and I'm agreeing with it. Do you guys know what tumors are? Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids. Right? And if that's not bad enough, let's go ahead and turn to chapter 6, verse 4. What is the trespass fearing with the Jews shall return him? They answered, five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the Lord of the Philistines, the, for the the same plague was on all of you and your lords. Therefore, make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravaged the land. Who do you think was the model? Right? <laughs> Can you turn to the left just a little bit? I'm trying to get this in. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know, right? I don't know. I don't know where they got there. So here's Ebenezer. That's where they were at. Here is uh, Ashkelon, which we haven't got to yet. I, apparently this is out of sync. I put it in the wrong place. But, oops, here is Ashdod. Near the water. It's right on the, on the coast there, right on the beach. And going back to the Ekron now, oops, wrong way. Look at how beautiful that is. Yeah. So... Um, so the five cities of the Philistines are going to be let me make sure uh, Aphek, Ekron, Ashdod, Ashkelon, uh, Ashkelon, and Gath. And that is on your paper here. Name the five cities of the Philistines. So that's going to be Aphek, Ekron, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and Gath. Well, you guys are writing those in. I'll continue. It says in verse 6, it says, Why then do you harden your heart as the Egyptians... And Pharaoh hardened their hearts. When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? Where are you? I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 6, verse 6. Okay. Let's read that again. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he did mighty things among them, did they not let the people go that they might depart? Let's see if I can give some thought to that. This is about 
1000 BC, 971 BC. When did the Egyptian stuff take place? Trying to give a timeline back. It had to be... They were in, they were in Egypt for 400 years. They were out 40 years. Went into Joshua. All that took place. Judges all took place. Ruth took place. And now here we are in Samuel. And they're still talking about the Egyptian deliverance. And it's not even the Israelites that are talking about it. It's the Philistines that are talking about it. So, you know, some of the things, here we are with the Philistines here. And as we're coming down the Mediterranean, you remember down and through here is where we get down into Egypt. Egypt was kind of comes through their land as a traveling area. So how long did that story last? I mean, how long did they talk about that story for years? Obviously, you know, many years to come. Okay, so when you harden your hearts as Egyptian, interesting, the story is still being talked about. So with the new cart, they sent back the ark to Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh. <clears throat> so it went from here to here to here, back to here. Now it's coming in to Beth Shemesh. Did the ark, I'm sorry, I wasn't watching. Did the ark go to Ashkelon? No. It did not. No. It, it went from Af, uh, from Aphek to Ashdod to Gath to Ekron. <clears throat> then to Beth Shemesh, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, this is a horrible, 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 horrible situation. So Israel took back the ark. And what was interesting is they came in, and I think they basically set the ark, the, the cart out, and watched it as it came in. I think, I want to say it came in here to Kirjath, Kirjath Tiriim. But nonetheless, they're watching it. The men of Beth Shemesh, have now taken control of the ark and they decided to look inside of it. God struck down 50,000 men. And 70. And 70. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Okay. So how crazy is that where you finally at that place where you're like, there's the ark. There's the ark. You know, how cool is this? And then they open up the ark only to have 50,000 and 70 <laughs> and so 70. Men, so those were men who, let, who were just from Kiriath, Jerim, that went into Beth Shemesh? No, I think these are the people of Beth Shemesh. So, the, so it says in verse 13, so now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping the wheat harvest in the valley and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua and Beth Shemesh and stood there and a large turn was there and they split the wood and they and of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering. Oh, sorry. So where did Kiriath This is where we're going to be going into now. Oh, sorry. Um, so from there, the Levites took the Ark of the Lord and, uh, and the chest. Then, uh, let's see. <laughs> okay. So before I go any further... Think of when they opened up the box. Okay, I can see a rat. <laughs> it's like, I don't know why they made golden rats. <laughs> but when they pulled out the tumors, <laughs> what is this, you know? Could you imagine the conversation around the dinner table that night? <laughs> okay, so... Um, so verse 20 of chapter 6, And the men of Bethlehem said, Who is able to stand before the Holy Lord God, and to whom shall it go up? So the, they sent messengers to the inhabitants of kirjath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it with you. Which I thought that was kind of a pretty awesome ending. So think about this, people. Let's see. Let me see. Thinking about all those people that died, it's not like fifty thousand people looked into it, but just the numbers. Just, yeah, right. Did. right. 
and the whole thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It says, and the Lord slew some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He slew 70 men of them, and then in Perens, 50,000 men. So I don't know. It almost makes it sound like he didn't slew 70 and 50,000, but he slew 70 of the 50,000 men, which is a different. Okay. I don't know that it's right. It's just kind of the way it reads. Right. So I don't have. I do have. Where is it at? Oh, I don't have. Dang, blasted. So Beth Shemesh, um, but could you imagine when the messengers go up to to Kerjath, Kerjath Dream? And said, okay, guys, Take this come get this. We don't want to touch it. Bad things have already happened. And then as they're coming down, okay, so back up real quick. Here's Gath. This is a vineyard. Um, this is where the ark went to. And then it went up to Ekron. This is some of the ruins of Ekron. Um, I want to get back to this. Oh, Beth Shemesh. Okay, a border city between Judah and Dan, Beth Shemesh, was given to the Levites. The Beth Shemesh was the most important Israelite city in the Zoric Valley as it watched both the east and the west traffic to the Zoric Valley and the north-south traffic along the diagonal route. Recent ex excavation have shown a thriving city here from the Middle Bronze Ages to the Iron Period. So however you see that, now these men from Kerjath Jerim <laughs> are coming down with, whether they're 70 or whether there's 50,000 men, on the ground as they're walking towards the ark. I mean, it's like, what happened here, guys? I don't know what happened. All we did was just open up the case. You know, I don't know what happened. You know, or th knowing them because of our flesh, all we did was just look at it. And that, that's all. We didn't even open it, you know. <laughs> it just popped out of the fire, <laughs> out of the fire right? But coming into the city and seeing all this, you know, I mean, you're definitely going to hear wailing. You're definitely going to hear crying. You're going to definitely hear this, this tear apart, you know, of what happened. So the Sorek Valley, the excavation of Beth Shemesh are visible in the foreground of the Sorek Valley to the west. Samson traveled down this valley numerous times, including the time when he killed the lion. And later he tied the tails of 300 foxes together. This is the vantage point of the Israelites who watched the Ark of the Covenant return to Beth Shemesh on a cow pulled cart from the land of the Philistines. So, I mean, you can see for a long way on something coming towards you. Zor and Eshtal, on the north side of the Sorg Valley at the Beth Shemesh, are the ancient villages of Zorah. Top of the ridge and Eshtal, picture off to the right. Samson's prophesied birth was in this area. As the location of the burial, as was the location of his burial. Samson's first girlfriend lived in Timnah, a few miles west of the Sorg Valley. His last girlfriend, Delilah, lives somewhere in this valley. I thought that was some interesting stuff because that takes us back to Judges. So, so people from Kiriath Jerim come down to Beth Shemesh. Uh, do I have that in here? In your notes, you should have... Is 8 Beth Shemesh? Yeah. yeah. And here it is going to go into... Where there in Kareth Jerim came and took the ark. Verse 2 it says, So it was that the ark remained in Kirjath Jerim a long time. And that is on our notes over here also. Where did the ark remain for a while? Uh, 
All right, so then going on to chapter 8, Israel rejects Sam, Samuel's sons as leaders. Joel and Abijah were judges in Beersheba, but didn't walk in the way of Samuel. So they, they went to Ramah in order to tell Samuel, give us a king, rejecting God as their king. And I want to read this. It's in chapter 8. Because this broke my heart here. Let's start in verse 10, I believe. Uh, now let's go back to, uh, let's say, verse 8, 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which have been done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, heed the voice, however you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. So now Samuel is coming into play here. But could you, can you hear the heart of God breaking here? This is where I have brought them, and, and if God had a checklist, it's like I brought Abraham from one place of the world to another place of the world. I spared his son from being sacrificed. I gave 12 tribes of Israel. We brought you in to, so you wouldn't die out. When, when you go back to Joseph ruling over in Egypt, basically he said that God planned this because even Egypt would have passed away if it wasn't for Joseph taking the position that he did. Because he was the one that said, okay, for seven years, we're going to keep it all together. Last seven years is going to be famine, and we're going to keep it all together. So if it wasn't for God putting Joseph in that position, even Egypt itself would have perished. So with God being in this all the way through this, taking him out through the Exodus, in through the, the Sinai, Val, uh, Sinai area, God brought them. And, he, and if he did this checklist, now they're saying, we want a king. We don't want God anymore. So you can hear God's heart just breaking here. Samuel goes on to warn Israel about their upcoming king and what they will do. Chapter 9, God chose... God chooses Saul. A Benjamin named Kish, Saul was, uh, was his son. We know that he was tall, dark, and handsome. And <laughs> this is really good here. And let's see if I can find it real quick. Um, Shalisha. Okay, so what ends up happening, what's going on here is uh, Saul's dad um, loses his donkeys, right? So the donkeys are all wandering. But it's I, I couldn't find the other one. Um, Shelaim, but I found Shelisha. So these donkeys are coming in through here and then somewhere else. I don't know where it's at. And then Zaf in verse 5, I have no idea where it's at. But I thought it was interesting that God uses a donkey to, to announce Saul to be the upcoming king. Again, even as I say that, he's using a donkey to bring in a king. Samuel announces to Saul that God is setting him up to be the king of Israel. Chapter 10, Samuel anoints Saul with oil. And this I didn't quite get, but it says, When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin and Zelza. Zelza is... We're on to my next one here. Here's Elza here. Is it right above, is Bethlehem? It's Bethlehem, yeah. So it's right above Bethlehem. <clears throat> and, I, and I didn't quite understand the story per se, but all I know is that he told them that there's going to be two Benjamites at Zilza. And they'll say to you, the donkeys which you were looking for have been found, and now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worrying about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? And then... Um, there are three men going up to God at Bethel, which is going to be up through here. 
So from Zilzal, what I didn't get about this is if there's three men from Bethel that are down here with them, or if he's meeting three men up in Bethel, what have you. That is also on your notes is Zelza is the uh, Rachel's tomb. How do you spell it? Z-E-L-Z-A-H. Sure. So then Samuel sends him to Gilgal where he meets people prophesying and to prophesy with them. So Gilgal's over here. So again, that makes sense that he would come up through here and then come across to Gilgal, but not clear to me. So from here to Bethel to Gilgal. <clears throat> then it says that the, uh, in verse 17 says that Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. Here's Mizpah. <laughs> again, I like that little ancient look. I thought it was pretty good. And says, God brought you out of everything, but today you have rejected the God. Uh, let me see if I'm making that right. Let's see where we're at. The one that has saved you from all that you have gone through and said, no, we don't want you. We want a king. Oh, this is where, this is the sad part here. So verse 17 of chapter 10. Then Samuel called the people together at the Lord of Mitzpah and said to the children of Israel, thus says the Lord of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all kingdoms and from those who have oppressed you but you have today rejected your God who himself saved you from all your adversaries and your tribulations and you have said to him no set a king over us now therefore present yourself before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans so this is where Saul gets recognized as the king. Chapter 11, Israel makes Saul king. The Ammonites go to war with Jabesh Gilead. Now, Jabesh Gilead, does anybody remember where Jabesh Gilead's at? Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to find it on this map because it's... You're close. Um, as I know, where Jabesh Gilead is actually going to be up where the, the Jabbok River comes over, right above that is Jabesh Gilead. So I put my little thing up here, Jabesh Gilead, which is up through here, but really it's over the river. Sure. <clears throat> but good job. Missed half the class and you still got it in your head. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so they go to Jabesh Gilead, and Jabesh makes a covenant with us, and their reply was uh, that they're going to put out their right eye. So then they sent a messenger to Saul. Saul gathered people in Be Bezek, up here above Shechem. Bezek, B-E-Z-E-K. And went and killed the Ammonites. <laughs> the story, i, I got to speed this up a little real quick. The Nah Nahash, the Amorite, answered them, On this occasion I'll make a covenant with you that I put out your right eye and bring reproach on all Israel. Then the elders of Jabesh said to him, Hold off for seven days, that we may send a messenger to all the territories of Israel, and if there's no one to save us, then we'll come out to you. <laughs> This negotiation stuff, this guy should not be the negotiator for these people. So the messenger came to Gibeah. So Gibeah is going to be here. And told Saul uh, the news of hearing up the people, and all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind a herd from the field and said, what troubles the people? What are they weeping? What are they told of the word of Jabesh? Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard the news, and his anger was greatly aroused. 
<clears throat> when he numbered them in Bezek, this is back down in verse 8, so we're back up here in Bezek, 300,000 uh, of children of Israel, and the men of Judah, 30,000. This is a ginormous amount of people. And then he says to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the time that the sun is hot, you shall have help. Then the messengers came and reported to the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do with us whatever you seem good to you. So it was on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came in the midst of the camp in the morning and watched and killed the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened, and those survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. So verse 14, then Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom. So now, so they were over here in Gibeah. They went up to Jabesh Gilead. And now he's bringing them back down to Gilgal. Samuel confirms Saul, recaps, uh, chapter 12, he recaps uh, the past from Moses and Aaron and Jacob. And when they had forgot the Lord, then Nahash, king of the Ammonites, came out against you. What did you say? No, 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 no. We want a king. Did you not know that God was your king? With that, here is your king, presents uh, Saul. But if you fear the Lord and you serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandments of the Lord, then both you and your king, that was interesting, both you and your king who reign over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if not, you're done. Then you prayed to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and lightning, and the people freaked out. Even when, even though you did all this, verse 22 says, it pleased the Lord. Let's look at verse 22 in chapter 12. The Lord will not forsake his people. And look at this. For his great name's sake, because it had pleased the Lord to make you his people. But as for me, far be it for me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider the great things he has done for you. But if you are still doing wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and who? Your king. So now we're going to the Battle of Mishmash. I only have a minute to get through this and too much to go through. So I'm going to kind of speed up through here. <laughs> um, so the Battle of Mishmash, Saul has 20, uh, excuse me, 2,000 men here in Mikmash. Oops, where did Mikmash go? Right here. And there was 1,000 in Bethel. And Jonathan had uh, people with him in Gibeah. So they are kind of this in the surrounding area. Oops. So, okay, so here's Mishmash. Here's the cliffs near Mishmash in the Gibeah to the south. Okay, so I got to show you this. Let me, let me. Okay, so here's Gibeon. I think I threw that in at the very beginning. So here we have the caves and the cliffs of Mishmash. There was a place in there, and I, and I couldn't find it right away, was where the men were hiding in the caves. I think this is in Mikmash. It's interesting. It's almost like a doorway, like a path that you had to go through. Um, but here are the cliffs near Mikmash, near Giba. Giba was what? It was, uh, what was, what was, uh, did I get to that yet? Um, who was in Giba? What what had happened? Oh, we're going to that now. Dag Lassen. Okay, so <laughs> so Mikmash Giba is the garrison of the Philistines. Okay, so this is where the Philistines were at when 
Saul and Jonathan had surrounded them by being in those three cities. This is the pass, pass from Mishmash. Okay, so I guess I'm done with the film. Okay, so um, here's Giba here. So you have Gibeah, Mishmash, and Bethel. Gibeah is going to be in through here. Um, so this is where they're joining up at. This is where the battle is going to take place. So Jonathan attacks the garrison in Giba. The, Philist the Philistines are prepared with 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and the people are as the sand as the sand of the land in Mishmash. Saul prepares for himself a sacrifice, and Samuel presents was upset. You guys remember where Saul uh, was waiting for Samuel. Samuel never showed up, so he was getting freaked out because people were like, we're out of here, man, we're just leaving. So he says, you know what, let me sacrifice a trespass offering to the Lord, and then we're going to go to battle. So he offers up a sacrifice. Well, that happened here in Gilgal. Okay, when when Samuel came up, he's all like, what did, what have you done? And he says, because you have done this, you basically have lost the kingdom. It says, the Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the commander over his people. This is starting to be the announcement of, of David. Then Jonathan takes off without telling him. Matter of fact, I have Gilgal here. So that must be on your little paper here. Jonathan attacked the garrison called... Oh, no, that's in Giba. Right. Sorry, yeah, it's Giba. And Saul was in where? Gilgal, when he was waiting for Samuel to do the sacrifice. Um, Jonathan says, uh, uh, okay, so Jonathan takes off without telling his dad to the garrison to fight against Philistines. Jonathan says, if, if they say, wait until we get there, then we'll wait. I'm sorry. Jonathan says, if we say, wait, then we will wait. But if they say, come up here, we know that God has given them to us. And there was an earthquake, and Saul made an oath that says that you cannot eat until he revenges his enemies. But he didn't know that Jonathan was missing, so Jonathan eats, and now he has to die. The people come to his rescue. He didn't die. The Philistines went home. Saul went home, but Saul established a sovereignty over Israel and fought against the Moabites, which you remember are the, over here. The Ammonites were over here. The Edomites that are down here. Zoba, I don't know where it's at, and the Philistines whenever possible. <laughs> what I love that part there. Chapter 15, Saul's obedience, uh, incomplete obedience. The Lord told Samuel to tell Saul to go and attack the, the Amalekites and destroy all that they have. Do not spare anything. So they gathered in Taliam 200,000 foot soldiers, 10,000 men of Judah. He spared the Canaanites because they showed kindness to Israel when they came out of Egypt. So this next part here where Saul attacked uh, Hivaila, he, uh, Havila, and Shur. You guys remember where Shur is at? Shur is when you are coming down through here and you're going into Egypt. This desert area here going into Egypt, this is Shur. The Havila, the Havila, whatever, seems to be kind of on the bottom end of the Dead Sea. All of this area was the Amalekites. So when they went to go take out the Amalekites, they took this whole region. Some of the places actually talk all the way over to by the Garden of Eden, but I don't see that they would go that far to take it out. So I'm believing that this place right below here was Havilah. That's on your paper too. And remember that Saul spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the cattle. Now God had rejected Saul as king. Saul went to Carmel and set up a monument for himself. And when he sees Samuel, he says, what a great job we did. I did all that God commanded. And then Samuel's response was, then what is the bleeding of this sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen, which I hear? And we go on to find out that, you know, what's the big deal? We killed him. And then he finds out the Agag, the king, the king is still alive, which he ends up going and taking him and killing him. When Samuel comes to Saul and he says, what's more important, obedience or sacrifice? Which is uh, verse 22 and 23 of chapter 15. 
As the Lord had great delight in the burnt offerings and sacrifice as obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed better than the fat of rams. That Remember that that was the uh, key verse. And the rebellion, and this is, this is kind of hard to even hear, for the rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is the iniquity of the idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So this is where Saul's downturn takes place here. Verse 29. Um, and also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. Do we remember that verse, that God's not a man? And then Samuel kills Agag. And the last one here, ending this part of the chapter, it says, Samuel, and this is on your paper here, Samuel returned to Ramah, and Saul to Gibeah. <laughs> and, and good, bad, right or wrong, that wraps up 15 chapters of 1 Samuel. So. That's crazy that Saul tells him after all that, forgive me for my sins and all this other stuff. And he goes, but honor me in front of everybody. Right. That's so crazy. Yeah, I mean, when even when he put... A memorial up for himself. I mean, just things started cranking wrong in his head. Then him grabbing Samuel <clears throat> from something. Can you imagine right? that, that anger, like grabbing Pastor <laughs> Right? Can we honor me in front of the elders. Rip his jacket. That's, that's crazy stuff. Right? So. I have two questions. Yes. Chapter 13, Saul sets up 2,000 in Mishmash. Mishmash. Oh, I completely missed that. Everybody else has it. <laughs> <laughs> and 1,000 in Bethel, and Jonathan had men in Gibeah. That's those three cities that's oh, surrounded. The way you still have one more is this better? Oh, this is awesome. Okay. Um, so tell me again, now what's 14? Is that sure to something? Um. Attacked from Havila to Shur, yeah. How do you spell Havila? H A V I L A H. And Shur is S H U R? Yes. Thank you. Sure. Sure thing. Sure thing. Sure thing. It's a sure thing. Yeah. So this is all in that Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim area. Lord, thank you for an evening. Uh, as exciting as this is, Lord, I, I pray that you'll just let this be on our hearts and that it'll just grow and grow and grow, Father. And all that we do, just be glorified. Amen, amen. And